knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. In the previous tutorial, we introduced the general characteristics of mollusks and listed the eight classes within the phylum. Class Gastropoda is by far the largest and most diverse class of phylum mollusca. In addition to the familiar terrestrial and freshwater snails and slugs, it contains the limpets, abalones, whelks, conchs, periwinkles, sea slugs, sea hares, nudibranchs, sea butterflies, and sea angels. They range in size from microscopic forms to large marine animals like the giant horse conch and the sea hares of genus Apletia, some of which can grow to over a meter in length. Gastropods have colonized a wide range of environments. Different species have been found living in gardens, woodlands, deserts, rivers, lakes, estuaries, brackish waters, polar regions, mud flats, intertidal zones, the abyssal zone, hydrothermal vents, and many other locations. Some gastropods are even parasites. Speaking of parasites, recall the earlier tutorial on the parasitic flatworms. Gastropods are often intermediate hosts for flukes. In addition, many species play important roles as detritivores and active hunters, and are important food sources for a wide range of predators. In order to examine gastropoda, we will discuss classification, form and function, including torsion, feeding habits, locomotion, respiration and circulation, and reproduction and development. To begin, gastropod classification is still a subject of some debate. Traditional classification thus far has generally recognized three major subclasses. First, there is prosobranchia, the largest subclass, nearly all of which are marine. This includes the conchs, whelks, periwinkles, moon snails, oyster borers, which bore into live bivalves and suck out their juices, and rock shells. Then there's the apistobranchs, which include numerous species of sea slugs, sea butterflies, and bubble shells. Finally, the pulmonates, which include land and most freshwater snails and slugs, which have a modified vascularized mantle wall that serves as a lung. However, this classification has more recently been widely accepted as evolutionarily inaccurate. A newer alternate classification includes the following five subclasses. Patellogastropoda, Vetigastropoda, Neuritimorpha, Canogastropoda, and heterobranchia. Yet another alternative includes at least seven different clades. Only time and further research can resolve this debate. In the meantime, let's move on to gastropod form and function, starting with one of their most distinguishing characteristics, their shell. Gastropod shells, when present, are always in one piece, known as a univalve. Some gastropod shells are well known for being ornate and highly prized by shell hunters. All of these shells are gastropod shells. You're probably familiar with a few of them. The whelk and conch shells are perhaps some of the most easily recognizable gastropod seashells. Many people recognize the characteristic shells, but far fewer people recognize the animals that create them. This is what a live conch looks like. Remember that mollusk shells are secreted by live mollusks, the seashells that people hunt and the shells that people put up to their ears to hear the ocean, which is actually just the sound that's produced when the air entering the seashell bounces about in the hollow cavity of the seashell, are the hardened excretions of what are essentially marine snails. It is worth noting that an animal most people would likely try to avoid creates structures that those same people might buy as gifts. Now let's look at shell structure. Gastropod shells begin at the apex, which contains the oldest and smallest whorl. The whorls become successively larger and spiral around the columella, or central axis. Since these shells are asymmetrical, they possess a quality called chirality, or handedness, that depends on the direction of the spiral. Over 90% of all gastropod species are always dextral, or right-handed, and less than 10% are always sinistral, or left-handed. A few species, like Amphidromus perversus, 
can be right or left-handed. The chirality of a gastropod is evident early in the process of coiling, or spiral winding, that occurs in the shell and visceral mass. The shell aperture is generally covered by a protective operculum. In addition to their univalve shell, another major defining characteristic of gastropods is torsion, the 180-degree twisting of the visceral mass during development that brings the anus to the anterior end. Most gastropods begin developing as transparent eggs that hatch into trochophore larvae that develop into villager larvae where the shell first forms. These larval swimming forms usually look very different from their adult forms. At this point, the mouth is located on the anterior end, and the anus is located on the posterior end. However, this doesn't last long. First, the shell rotates 90 degrees. Then the anus and mantle continue to rotate another 90 degrees until the anus and mantle cavity open directly above the mouth and head. This allows for extra space above the animal's head, meaning it can quickly retreat into its shell when threatened, but it also means that it literally defecates on top of its own head, and gills could potentially cause serious fouling, a term that refers to excreted waste washing back into the gills, which can be detrimental. This unique arrangement has, unsurprisingly, intrigued and baffled scientists for generations. Several explanations have been proposed, but the one that seems the most likely deals with coiling and bilateral asymmetry. Look closely at this picture of a common freshwater snail. The shell is clearly asymmetrical, but the body demonstrated by this slug is symmetrical. Notice that due to the asymmetry of the shell, the body is also shifted over for better weight distribution. Internally, most gastropods lack the gill, atrium, and kidney of the right side, and this helps them avoid fouling. Water is brought into the left side of the mantle cavity and out the right side. As the water exits, so do the waste products expelled by the anus and nephridiopore, a part of the urinary system, which are located on the right side. Next up, the feeding habits of gastropods are quite varied, but all involve some modification of the radula, the tongue-like feeding apparatus that is actually a minutely toothed chitinous ribbon. Most gastropods are herbivores that rasp particles of algae off hard surfaces. They do this by extending their radula, which scrapes the surface and removes tiny particles that are deposited into the esophagus. Other herbivores, like the abalone, as well as common garden slugs and snails, hold their food in their foot and break off pieces using their radula. Others, like the true whelks of genus Buxinum, are scavengers, while still others are carnivores that tear into their prey with radular teeth. Some, like the oyster borers, drill holes into the shells of oysters using a combination of their modified radula and caustic chemicals, and then feed continuously for days, tearing apart the soft flesh of its prey. Still other carnivores, like the infamous cone snails, are extremely venomous and feed upon fish, worms, and other mollusks using a modified hollow radula that injects a unique mix of toxic peptides known as conotoxins. Other gastropods, like the queen conch, feed on organic deposits in the sand or mud, and still others, like many species of sea butterflies, feed by catching planktonic food by entangling it in a mucus web that coats their bodies. But gastropod feeding strategies get weirder still. The adorable leaf sheep is a species of sacoglassa, or solar-powered sea slug, that is capable of kleptoplasty, where the sea slug retains the chloroplasts from the algae they feed on, thereby enabling the animal to indirectly perform photosynthesis. However, the sacoglassins aren't the only symbiotrophic gastropod. The scaly foot gastropod, or volcano snail, is a species of deep-sea hydrothermal vent snail that is found in hydrothermal vents at depths of about 2,400 to 2,900 meters. It is the only known animal to use iron 2,3 sulfide, or gregite, in its skeleton. Its feeding habits as a juvenile are unknown, but when it settles as an adult, it obtains all of its nutrition from the chemoautotrophy of the endosymbiotic bacteria that live within its body. It uses no other mechanism for feeding. It is possible that there are many other species of deep-sea gastropods just waiting to be discovered. 
Moving on to locomotion, gastropods use a single blood-filled appendage, the foot. For many gastropods, the power for locomotion is provided by muscular waves that undulate along the ventral surface of the foot. The force of these waves is then coupled to the substratum by a thin layer of petal mucus. This mucus acts as a glue, allowing the animal to adhere to the substratum on which it crawls while muscular waves ripple through its body. Some gastropods, like the sea angels and sea butterflies, fly in the water using their modified foot as wings that they clap together at the tips and drag them apart, which sucks fluid into a gap, creating low-pressure vortices that propel them forward. Respiration in most gastropods is performed by the tenidium, which is essentially a specialized gill that is made up of an axis with a row of projecting filaments, while most land-dwelling species have a highly vascularized area of their mantle cavity that serves as a lung. Most gastropods have a single kidney in addition to well-developed circulatory and nervous systems. They also have eyes or other simple photoreceptors, statocysts for a sense of balance, tactile organs like tentacles for a sense of touch, and chemoreceptors for taste and smell. No analysis of a class would be complete without a look at reproduction, and some gastropods are renowned for their intricate courtships and rituals. Though some gastropods simply discharge sperm and ova into the water column, most practice internal fertilization. Some gastropod species are dioecious, meaning they are male or female. Others are monoecious, meaning they are both male and female at the same time, and are capable of self-fertilization. Still others are protandric, meaning their testes develop first, then wither and ovaries develop as the animal matures. Most interestingly, many gastropods practice internal fertilization and perform prolonged courtship ceremonies, sometimes involving a love dart. Love darts are not used to transfer sperm, and there is no organ to receive it, so the copulating animals instead merely stab each other with them. The mucus on the dart contains a pheromone-like compound that promotes sperm preservation in the receiver, thereby favoring the snail that fired the dart. Other copulation rituals involve the formation of circles where each snail follows the other and they then rotate clockwise. Others, like the common leopard slug, hang off of branches and form glowing structures with their elaborate penises that emerge from the side of their head and simultaneously transfer sperm. With that image, we conclude our summary of the gastropods. Let's move forward and examine bivalves next. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.